This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Okay, guys, today's episode is about Jordan Peterson. We're calling it the Jordan Peterson effect. So some of you may not know who Jordan Peterson is. He's actually kind of just risen to fame and renown just in the last several months, especially, but really in the last couple of years. So for those of you who don't know who he is, I'm going to go and bring you up to speed a little bit. So he's a uh, professor of psychology at the University of Toronto currently, uh, and he's also a clinical psychologist with, you know, over 30 years of experience. So pretty boring dude, right? I mean, it's not exactly a profile of a gangster, but this dude, especially if you've listened to him or paid attention to him for any length of time, he kind of is a gangster. So um, really, this guy has been railing against kind of this political correctness culture that so much of us see now, but he's been railing on it since the 1990s. And so he's especially been railing on it, how it's manifested itself in universities in the West. So he's talking about North America and Europe and those types of things. So uh, he spent a lot of time warning people, uh, really, anyone that would listen of kind of the dangers of Marxist and communist thinking and also the issues that you can run into with identity politics or really the whole postmodernist movement. And so this stuff is just now coming into vogue, really, especially if you pay attention to stuff on the political right. You're seeing a lot of that really in the last several years. But this guy's like OG on that. Like he's been on this for like 30 years. This is not really a thing that it has been lost on him. So um, he's warned a lot of us of the dangers also of focusing too much on fascism, fascism, and like Nazism uh, and not really giving enough focus to Maoism and Stalinism. And so he's certainly not claiming that fascism and Nazism are things that shouldn't be looked at and be warned about. But uh, Mao and Stalin combined killed so many more people than even what happened in Nazi Germany. And that's just by way of comparison. I'm by no means saying one was better than the other, but he, that's why he's really focused on the other two. So, um, but when most people started to really know who Dr. Jordan Peterson was, was whenever uh, he became uh, one of the most vocal opponents of the uh, Bill C-16 in Canada, okay? So if you're not familiar with Bill C-16, uh, what it actually stands for, it's an act to amend the Canadian hum- Human Rights Act and the Criminal Code, okay? So just for any of you that don't know, because I'm assuming most of you listening to this podcast are Americans, the Canadian Human Rights Act was something that was set up in the 70s, in the late 70s, and it was really set up to protect the rights of Canadians um, and provide Provide equal opportunity to minority groups, so minority Canadians. So, uh, and they define you know minority groups as you know basically depending upon your sex, your sexual orientation, uh, your race, your creed, you know your age, your religious beliefs, kind of all those different things. So, uh, Bill C sixteen uh, became law on June nineteenth of two thousand and seventeen. So, not even a year ago. Uh, and I want to give everyone the summary of what Bill sixteen did because basically it was adding to the list of things that I was talking about earlier, like the list of the different groups that are protected by the Canadian Human Rights Act. So um, this is a legislative summary of Bill C-16, so I'm just going to go ahead and read that to you now. The bill is intended to protect individuals from discrimination within the sphere of federal jurisdiction and from being the targets of hate propaganda as a consequence of their gender identity or their gender expression. The bill adds, quote, gender identity or expression, unquote, to the list of prohibited grounds of discrimination in the Canadian Human Rights Act and the list of characteristics of identifiable groups protected from hate propaganda in the criminal code. It also adds that evidence that any offense was motivated by bias, prejudice, or hate based on a person's gender identity or expression constitutes an aggravating circumstance for a for a court to consider when imposing a criminal sentence. So that's the summary of Bill C-16. So essentially it's adding the, uh, the group of gender identity and expression to that group of minority or underrepresented people that could be, uh, could be harmed in some way. So, so basically just, you know, to kind of take all that kind of judicial language and put it into layman's terms, you can be charged in Canada, you can be charged with the human rights violation crime for infringing on the rights of people that believe they're a different gender than what their biology would su- would suggest. Okay, so so what this bill is really uh, doing, it's allowing for compelled speech. Okay, so if I were to say that instead of my name being Kyle, that my name is actually Katie, and that I'm a woman, even though biologically that is ridiculous, you would have to refer to me as Mrs. or Miss Thompson. Okay.
So I'm not Mr. Kyle Thompson. I'm either Ms. or Mrs. Katie Thompson or whatever, okay? So the thing is, is if you refuse to do this, if you refuse to call me by my preferred gender pronoun, you could be charged with a crime, okay? So as ridiculous as that may sound, there's actually a lot of people in Canada that were very, very supportive of this bill. So uh, one of the people, obviously, that was not very supportive of this was Dr. Jordan Peterson. So he came out extremely, extremely vocally in opposition to Bill C-16. Um, and he even spoke at a Senate committee meeting against the bill uh, about a month or so before it was eventually ratified into law. And so usually uh, when people say they've heard of Jordan Peterson for the first time, they usually saw the the clips of him talking about B- Bill C-16 in front of that Senate committee. Um, but here's the interesting thing about Jordan Peterson and all this is one of the biggest misconceptions here is that Jordan Peterson's opposition was to the use of pronouns. Right. That if a student were to come up to him and say, no, I'm I'm not actually this sex, I'm another sex or using one of the other pronouns that he would have been against that. But the thing about that is at the time and uh, so many times since then, he has repeatedly said that he would work with a student that wished to go by a different pronoun. Like that, he would absolutely do that. His issue with Bill C-16 was that it was compelling speech, thus infringing on free speech rights, which, you know, in Canada, they don't really have free speech, especially not like we have here pretty much completely in the United States. So one thing that was interesting is he was asked if he would comply with the request of a student to use a preferred pronoun. And this was actually uh, Peterson's response. He said, quote, it would depend on how they asked me. If I could detect that they there was a chip on their shoulder or that they were asking me with political motives, then I probably would say no. If I could have a conversation like the one we're having now, I could probably meet them on an equal level, unquote. Okay. So, and he went even more specifically into his opinion. He actually wrote an op-ed for the National Post, and this is what he said there. Quote, I will never use words I hate, like the trendy and artificially constructed words zay or zer. Those are the uh, pronouns that people have made up in the transgenderism word, a world. Okay. Back into the quotes. These words are at the vanguard of a postmodern, radical leftist ideology that I detest, and which is, in my professional opinion, frighteningly similar to the Marxist doctrines that killed at least 100 million people in the 20th century. I have been studying authoritarianism on the right and on the left for 35 years. I wrote a book, Maps of Meaning, the Architecture of Belief, on the topic, which explores how ideologies hijack language and belief. As a result of my studies, I have come to believe that Marxism is a murderous ideology. I believe its practitioners in modern universities should be ashamed of themselves for continuing to promote such vicious, untenable, and anti-human ideas, and for indoctrinating their students with these beliefs. I am therefore not going to mouth Marxist words. That would make me a puppet of the radical left, and that is not going to happen. Period. Unquote. Okay, so uh, here's the thing. Because of his viewpoints and, and opinions and him being so vocal about them, um, many of the issues that we've already discussed up to this point, he's been really erroneously categorized as a lot of the things that you would expect from people that kind of fall on that kind of radical political left. So just the fact that he said anything like these things that you've read, um, no matter how based in logic they are or not, he's been called a racist, a sexist, a, sexist, a, a transphobe, a homophobe, and he's even been called alt-right, which... If you know about his background and you know anything about him, the fact that he's called alt-right is just kind of hilarious. That's, I guess, kind of like a catch-all term for people that you don't like. If you're on the left, you just call him alt-right, which is ridiculous. And even after some of these comments came out, there were some protests against him on campus, and and there was a little bit of violence, but not really much to, to speak of. But the thing about this that was so interesting is because of all this hubbub kind of surrounding him and all this this drama, uh, people that are on the other side of these issues uh, have been completely enamored with Peterson's viewpoints. Uh, I mean, because he's somebody that that kind of falls more so on the political right, but he's coming at things from a much more kind of balanced philosophical and intellectual perspective. And it's kind of a breath of fresh air when you have people that are, you know, completely ridiculous on that side of the aisle saying just absurd things. So it's it's really refreshing. Um, and so uh, back around this time, he began he uh, began a YouTube channel and he started uploading a lot of his lectures. Right. Uh, and some of these lectures, guys, I mean, they're two or three hours long. Like these are not your normal 45, 50 minute lectures that you may have had in undergrad. These are incredibly dense philosophical and psychological uh, lectures that he was putting up. And these videos have gotten millions and millions of views. And I mean, all of them, like there's some that are short form, but a lot of them are long form. And so as of this recording uh, that I'm doing right now, he has over 800,000 subscribers 
to his YouTube channel. This guy is, he's a psychology professor for goodness sakes. Like that, that is essentially what he does. And he has all this attention, right? Um, even last year in 2017, he did over a dozen lectures over, uh, the old Testament biblical stories and their psychological and archetypal importance to overall life. I mean, and you want to talk about a very, very dense subject. And each one of those has hundreds of thousands, if not millions of views. Um, and back in May of 2017, he was on Joe Rogan's podcast, which his podcast is one of, if not the consistently the, the biggest podcast out there. And so he was on there on episode 958 um and joe rogan at the very beginning of that episode before it went into the recording of his interview he said it was his favorite podcast he had ever done his favorite interview this is a guy that at that point had done almost a thousand of those and he was like this is by far the best conversation i had ever had so some people really found uh jordan peterson around that time uh and so recently you may have heard him in the news again uh because he's kind of had a lot of different memes put out there but he did an interview on channel four in the new which was a, a news station in the uk where he pretty much shellacked this interviewer uh named kathy newman who was really just continuously trying to catch him in a bunch of gotcha questions um, and just watching him take down this interviewer, but not, you know, with verbal barbs necessarily, but just by being incredibly precise with his language and being very specific in how he was answering things and understanding what was, what was actually happening there during the interview. It was just impressive to watch. It was a 30 minute interview. So it wasn't like these sound bitey interviews you get on like Fox news or CNN or MSNBC. It was a long form interview where they could really dig into some stuff. So, and for me, I've become a fan of Jordan Peterson since I heard about him during the Bill C-16 stuff. He was just an incredibly interesting guy. I've listened to a bunch of his interviews on YouTube and other podcasts that he's been on. I've listened to actually all of the biblical series lectures that he's posted up to this point. And I think this year he's actually going to go even further. He spent most of last year just going through Genesis um, and he's going to be going through uh, Exodus, I believe, this year. And so it's just incredibly dense material by this guy, but it's so, so interesting. And some of these podcasts, or sorry, yeah, the podcast he's posted, but the live lectures that he did on the biblical series, some of these were like three hours just to go over a verse or two of, of Genesis. So it's just incredibly, incredibly cool stuff. So, um, but the thing is, is I, I kind of took for granted that most people in this space and, you know, people that would be interested in, you know, say this podcast that they all knew who he was. And so I kind of got a, a realization that that's not the case. Uh, a couple of days ago, I got a text message from Brandon Scaff. He's one of the guys that runs dead men stuff. So they've got a podcast and they've got a website, uh, that I've, uh, written one article for before. Um, but he sent me this fan, uh, fathom article. Uh, it's a, like an online magazine. Um, and it was entitled the voice evangelical men wish they had how Jordan Peterson is the father and pastor of thousands of young Christians. And so this was an article that was posted on February 12th of 2018. Um, and it was written by a guy named Anthony Bradley, who's a author and a professor of religion, theology, and ethics at King's college in New York city. So obviously the title was incredibly catchy for someone who's a Jordan Peterson fan, but also someone who's interested in Christian manhood and those different things. It really caught my attention. And I read the article and it was really, really solid. And, um, so I want to do something right now because this, this was not the plan for this week's podcast, but I just wanted to make sure since, you know, Jordan Peterson is still in the news and this article is making the rounds a little bit, I'm actually going to read the entire article to you. Okay. And that's something I would not normally do on this podcast. I know I read sections of things from time to time, but I'm, I'm just going to read the entire thing to you. It's not going to take me very long, but th the thing about it is I want to read it so that you can hear the entire thing, right? Because I have a tendency to skim things when I read them. Uh, some people struggle with reading, like my reading comprehension is not very good. So sometimes I don't get every bit of it, but I, when I listen to it, I seem to get it a little bit better. And so I just don't want you to skim through this and miss some details because I'm going to go into detail on this article after I'm done reading it, but I'm just going to go ahead and read the entire thing now. So here we go. For about a month now, I've been trying to sort out why so many of my male students, Christian guys in their 20s, are such huge fans of Jordan Peterson. By the end of chapter two of his new book, The 12 Rules for Life, I had my answer. Peterson understands something about the world of men that evangelical pastors seem to have been clueless about for almost 30 years. It is simply this. Since the 1980s, young men have been shamed and emasculated in a culture determined to destroy the archetypal masculinity of figures like Jesus Christ. 
Evangelical pastors and leaders have been exegeting the culture of men from an outdated mid-1960s cultural playbook, a playbook that often reduced men to lustful sinners who think too highly of themselves and need to be tamed by someone reminding them of their destined depravity. Excoriating men, then, is what sensitized men to the gospel. The builder generation taught the approach to baby boomers, who taught it to Gen Xers, who taught it to emerging millennial leaders. What did they miss? Perhaps because of a non-biblical fetish within the, quote, culture war, unquote, or lusting after access to power by syncretizing Christianity with the politics of the Republican Party, many evangelical leaders paid too much attention to the social disintegration of archetypal masculinity that pervaded American society in the 1970s and the 1980s instead of the masculinity implosion within the walls of their own churches. In the early 1990s, however, poet, poets and psychologists influenced by psychologist Carl Jung were sounding a loud alarm. Jungian influenced poets like Robert Bly and Jungian psych psychologists like Robert L. Moore and Douglas Gillette with books such as King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, Rediscovering the Archetypes of the Mature Masculine were key figures in what became the 1990s, quote, men's movement, unquote. While Jungians, post-liberal Protestants like Sam Keane, and Roman Catholics like Patrick Arnold in his book, Wild Men, Warriors, and Kings, Masculine Spirituality and the Bible, borrowed heavily from the Jungian archetypal discourse on masculinity. Evangelicals, with their aversion to secular social scientists, were excited instead by Promise Keepers, which launched in 1990. The well-intentioned Promise Keepers movement, in part, set out to save men, retrieve biblical manhood, and put them in accountability groups that would restrain their masculinity from growing sinfully out of control. While evangelicals were directing men to pledge their allegiance to moralistic promises, Jungians were trying to help men recover their hearts and souls. Jordan Peterson is retrieving the Jungian archetypal discussions for the disintegrated, shame-driven, emasculated lives of young men for the 21st century. Evangelicals were not reading psychiatrists like Andrew P. Morrison or historians like Christopher Lash, both of whom saw the narcissism brewing in American life increasingly valued people on the basis of performance. A narcissistic and performance-oriented culture eventually becomes a culture characterized by perfectionism. A perfectionist culture sets up every man to be destroyed by the shame of not measuring up to his idealized self. The world that nurtured millennial and Gen Z men is that of exaggerated and romanticized versions of masculine success aimed at winning and the validation and affirmation of others. In this perfectionist world, you never measure up, which forces you to think there's something ontologically wrong with you. Toxic shame, then, leads men to self-assess as pathetic, weak, worthless, stupid, cowardly, foolish, inadequate, insufficient, or never good enough. Boomers and Gen Xers continue to browbeat, berate, and shame millennials and Gen Z teens for trying to numb their shame with drugs, alcohol, video games, sexual promiscuity, pornography, and so on. The shame that young men carried was reshamed by ministry leaders who wanted these men to feel low enough for the gospel. What they didn't understand was that these men were acquainted with lowliness. A large percentage of men born after 1990 already felt weak, beaten down, and worthless. Young men needed empathetic pastors to build them up to be the men that God created them to be. Jordan Peterson is the prophet who understands this reality. As an observant Jungian and college professor, Peterson knows that 30 years of raising men in a culture that destroyed the archetypal, aspirational Jesus needs the antidote of empathy, encouragement, and practical day-to-day -day imagination to help men recover their souls so that they can live a life that means something. Evangelicals tried. In the early 2000s, John Eldridge attacked men's shaming by addressing the father wound in Wild at Heart, but his paradigm ultimately missed the mark because he focused too much on fathers and not enough on the other issues men face with other people in their lives. Eldridge also reduced masculinity to outdoor living in the West, which inadvertently isolated urban and suburban men. The Gen X leaders of the Young, Restless, and Reformed, the YRR movement, also gave it a try. But taking cues from their boomer pastors, many bearded, beer-drinking, flannel-shirt-wearing Calvinist pastors berated guys for not having good theology, for playing video games, for being single, for struggling with porn and sexual addictions, for not, quote, manning up, unquote, and so on. They did this without a drop of compassion for the shame they already had. To make matters worse, many of them falsely believed that throwing 500-year-old theological propositions at men's shame would magically free them of their emasculation of never measuring up to their own expectations. But they didn't measure up enough for God.
Associations like Acts 29 and Acts 29 like non-denominational Gen X and millennial leaders gave a valiant effort, but many of those megachurches were just a shame berating as be emasculating culture at large. Men were destroyed were destroyed in the YRR context because quote real preaching unquote is making guys feels like feel like losers for the shame they already had. Moreover, young men were yelled at to stop wasting their lives. Upper class young men were told that their lives were pathetic models of idol factories that needed to be destroyed so that they could become domesticated, humble, friendless, nice guys. For empathy and encouragement, more and more young Christian men have turned to Jordan Peterson. He is the father and pastor that thousands of millennial and Gen Z men have needed for nearly 30 years. With Peterson, young men get the truth-telling sage who empathizes with their suffering, compassionately cares about their hearts, invites them to greatness instead of niceness, and calls them to hope and humility without shaming. As long as young men's shame receives no empathy and encouragement from evangelical parents and leaders, young men will continue to seek help elsewhere. In the end, if you want to know where the young men are in your church or school, they are likely at home listening to Peterson on YouTube because he is giving them the encouragement and challenge they really need. And they're doing it with the other 750,000 subscribers. Okay, so that wraps up uh, reading that. Uh, and uh, again, that goes a lot of different areas. So it's not a super long article, but it goes really in a bunch of different directions. And it's going to be just impossible for me to get a thorough podcast in if I if I look at every single detail. But there are actually five quotes that I wanted to kind of pull out of that and talk a little bit more about. So uh, and these are in chronicle, chronological order as to where they appear within the article. So uh, the first quote I want to pull out is this quote. It is simply this. Since the 1980s, young men have been shamed and emasculated in a culture determined to destroy the archetypal masculinity of figures like Jesus Christ. Okay, unquote. Yes, yes, yes. Like so much yes. Like that is so early in the article and that is such a huge statement. I'll, I'll read the last part again. Young men have been shamed and emasculated in a culture determined to destroy the archetypal masculinity of figures like Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. Again, guys, we live in a culture where being a pussy is celebrated. We, that's exactly where we live right now. I mean, unless you fail to protect someone weaker than you, at which point you're branded as a coward. I, I love, I don't know if I've ever brought this up in the podcast before, but there was a, a news story. I believe there was a, uh, a, little, a little cruise liner ship of some kind. I think it was off the coast of Italy. This was several years ago where um, these men um, and women and children, they were, they were all kind of going down. The ship was going down. Right. And so as a lot of people hit the water, there was kind of some chaos around who had life vests or not. And there were reports of men that were like ripping life vests out of the arms of women and children and, you know, risking their lives in the process. And these were people that were universally branded as cowards, which is kind of interesting because you have a lot of these, you know, biological evolutionists that, you know, basically that's survival of the fittest, but you know, we can't really talk about that, but we, we live in a culture that has tried to emasculate manly men. Right. And, and then the church as, as its own self has tried to emasculate Jesus. We've talked about that a lot. So, I mean, if you go back to episode four of this podcast and you know, when I've done interviews on other people's podcasts, I talk a lot about how the church has declawed the lion of Judah. I mean that, and again, I, I mentioned in that podcast that the church is one of the few places where being a weak and effeminate men is okay. If not being just all out encouraged, right? So when we look at that statement, talking about how society has tried to basically destroy the archetypal masculine, archetypal masculinity, like guys like Jesus Christ, Jesus is the ultimate archetypal man, right? And really society has destroyed that. And the church has basically stood by with their thumb up their butt and just watched it. Right. Because we've we've looked at this guy, Jesus Christ, who is the Lion of Judah. And we only talk about the Lamb of God. And it's just like, that's all we want to talk about, because the Lion of Judah is way too scary to talk about. So Jordan Peterson and his his idealism uh, around certain things and, and truth is really leading us back in the other direction. So that's one of the first quotes. The second quote I wanted to bring up was this quote. The well-intentioned to promise keepers movement in part set out to save men, retrieve biblical manhood and put men in accountability groups that would restrain their masculinity from growing sinfully out of control. While evangelicals were directing men to pledge their allegiance to moralistic promises, Jungians were trying to help men recover their hearts and souls. Jordan Peterson is retrieving the Jungian archetypal discussion for the disintegrated, shame-driven, emasculated lives of young men for the 21st century. So here's the deal. is uh, I was born in 1986, so obviously when, when Promise Keepers was launched, I was like four years old. But I grew up in a family that didn't go to church at all, so I'm not sure I've ever even heard of it while I was young. I really heard about it when I was older. But I've talked to a lot of men that were around 
uh, whenever this was really at its height. And apparently it was like incredible. Like it was amazing. Like they would do these meetings at different places in the country and they would like literally fill football stadiums with people like in just, just men. Right. So they, these were men's events. And if you look at it in the modern Christian context, I mean, think about your church. First question is, does your church have a men's ministry? And the answer is most likely no. And okay, guys, if your church like twice a year does like a an 8 a.m. Saturday morning prayer breakfast for dudes, no, your your church does not have a men's ministry. But guys were coming out in droves to, to watch um, speakers and to be a part of these accountability groups. But uh, like many other uh, things in this space, it eventually petered out. And I, and I think it was probably because of the goal overall, because again, the, the big win for promise keepers was, yeah, getting you to come to a promise keepers event, but it was getting you into these accountability groups. And, and to be honest, I, I've talked to other ministries, especially some, uh, some big ministries here in the Oklahoma city area for men. And I've asked some of the guys, like, what's your big win? Like, what's your main thing that you want guys to be able to accomplish with your ministry? And they all say they want to get guys in accountability groups. And, I, and I've never really understand, understood why, like, like we've talked about before, women tend to do well in circles, but men want to be shoulder to shoulder. Again, that's an oversimplification, but that, it's the truth. Most men want to accomplish things and do things with other men. They, they don't want to just sit around and talk. And, and there's nothing wrong with sitting around with a group of guys. But at the end of the day, like most guys want to get out and do things. So, um, and here's the deal. It, we know this to be true. If a man recovers his heart and soul, this is going back to the quote, don't you think they will be able to better control their sinful desires? I mean, just think about yourself. If you recover your heart and soul, right, as if it's something that you've lost or something that you don't understand, but then you dial it in, don't you think you'll be be able to better control your, you know, wanting to drink alcohol whenever you're kind of an alcoholic or wanting to look at porn and jerk off whenever you know that's like a big problem for you? So th those are just things that we need to constantly remind ourselves of. All right, so let's go into the third quote here. Here it is. Quote, in the early 2000s, John Eldridge attacked men's shaming by addressing the father wound in Wild at Heart. But his paradigm ultimately missed the mark because he focused too much on fathers and not enough on other issues men face with other people in their lives. Eldridge also reduced masculinity to outdoor living in the West, which inadvertently isolated urban and suburban men. So obviously we're big fans of, of the book Wild at Heart. It's on the 100 books that every modern Christian man should read list on our website. Um, now, I disagree with the author of this blog going after Eldridge for the father wound. Uh, I, I think, I think he kind of missed the mark in his criticism. It was a little bit unfair. And now here's the thing is John Eldridge would be the first one to tell you that his father wound thing was an incomplete description of the problem because he fully described the father wound, but he didn't really go too much into a mother wound or a brother wound or a best friend wound. But the thing was, is obviously the father wound is a huge wound that has really truly affected men over and it's a generational thing, right? So, um, you know, the father wound is incomplete when you just talk about it by itself, but Eldridge's overall synopsis isn't wrong. So, um, now here's the thing with John Eldridge. And again, we, we like his stuff, especially that book, but he does come off as a very empathetic guy. So I, I'm wondering why the author of this blog kind of put John Eldridge out there and just basically mentioned him for like three sentences and essentially just put him on blast. Uh, he really should love this guy because this whole article really talks about empathy. Um, now, here's the thing. John Eldridge, if you've ever seen him present live or any seen any of his videos, he, he comes off as a little bit fake. You know, I can see how you would you would be able to say that. He's kind of a frail guy. He's a smaller guy. And so some of the things he says, you're just kind of wondering if he even means it. And, you know, even some things like in some of his live things, he kind of cusses in rooms uh, full of men, but it's kind of, it's just for no reason. It doesn't really add anything to the story. It's just like he feels like he has license to do so. Um, but I will say the, the quote at the end here, the commentary on outdoor living, I thought that was spot on. And it's something I've actually never really thought about until I read this article that, yeah, if you didn't live in the West and you weren't attached to nature and you didn't go on hikes all the time. I, I could see, I mean, if you're just a dude that lives in, in Philly or New York city or Boston or something like that, being like, bro, I don't even understand that. I don't remember the last time I've seen a leaf, much less like walked out and just like pulled pine needles off a tree. So it's just, it's just kind of one of those deals. I thought that was a, a fair criticism there at the end. And it never really thought about how uh, that book may have missed some guys because of that exact quote. So uh, let's go to quote number four here that I wanted to pull out. So here it is quote, Men were destroyed in the YRR, the Young, Restless, and Reformed context, because, quote, real preaching, unquote, is making guys feel like losers for the shame they already had. Moreover, young men were yelled at to stop wasting their lives, unquote. Okay, I got a lot of problems with the author putting this in there. Because isn't this kind of the point, right? 
like you're not going to hear me be one of the guys railing against why I why are our people for real preaching because it's kind of what helped get us into this mess of this modern malaise that we have in modern Christianity it's <clears throat> it's all the fluffy TED talk with a Bible verse preaching that has really allowed men to operate in this way so uh, I, I don't really like the criticism there of people that are are preaching in that way because the the thing is is I kind of get the sense that the author of this blog is a little bit soft maybe a little bit of a sensitive guy and so that's why he seems to focus on empathy a lot and he doesn't really focus at all on discipline and here's the deal is sometimes guys should feel like losers right I, I truly believe that guys sometimes need to wallow in their failure to where they can realize what's on the other side if they really kind of step up right so if you're a guy and you're fat you need, you need to feel yourself get to the top of a flight of stairs and be out of breath, right? So that you can know you need to fix something, right? If you're dumb, like, you should feel that when you're in a situation that requires you to have some mental resilience, right? And you can't really drum it up. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can't really drum it up. That's something that you should really look at, right? If you're weak physically, it's something you should fix. If you're lazy, it's something you should fix. If you're an absentee father or husband, it's something that you can fix, Right? So I, I really don't like that, that quote from, from here because it's really kind of letting some guys off the hook when I really think for the, for the most part, a lot of these guys really need to kind of sit in their own shame a little bit at least. So let's go ahead and get into the fifth quote here, the last quote, and here it is. Quote, with Peterson, young men get a truth-telling sage who empathizes with their suffering, compassionately cares about their hearts, invites them to greatness instead of niceness, and calls them to hope and humility without shaming. So, um... Here's the thing. I'm not sure if the author of this blog has really listened or read much of Peterson's works. Um, now, here's the deal. Peterson definitely uses some empathic methods, right? He was obviously a clinical psychologist for 30 years, but he doesn't really allow people to wallow in that. So in the first part of that quote where he talks about empathizing with their suffering and compassionately cares about their hearts, yes, but he, he does it in a very specific way. So uh, I recently heard him talk about in an interview uh, about this guy he was working with that had like an unbelievable fear of needles. Okay. Everyone's got their fears. This guy's fear was of needles. So it went down back to a point in his childhood where he was actually held down by six dentists so that they can give him a shot in his mouth so that uh, I'm assuming to get a cavity filled or something like that. So obviously a, a fairly scarring experience to be held down, you know, while you're sentient and then just have a needle jammed into your mouth. Um, but the, the path he went through with this guy was n not just being empathetic, right? He wasn't just saying how much he understood and all those different things and kind of, you know, aligning it with certain things in his life. He wanted to work this guy to where he could operate in a setting that had needles in it, right? So he took him down a path. At first, he just talked to the guy about needles. That, that was all he could get to get the guy to do was to get him to talk about needles. And then... Uh, in you know these are all kind of over a bunch of different meetings over I'm assuming several weeks or months but in one of the later meetings they would look at pictures of needles so Jordan Peterson would, would hold out a picture of a needle and this guy would have to hold it in his hand and he would have to talk about the pictures of the needles right and then at a later meeting there was a needle that was hidden in the room somewhere and so Jordan Peterson just said hey you know there's a needle in this room just want to let you know I'm not going to pull it out I'm not going to show it to you but there's a needle in this room you know getting the guy closer and closer right then he put the needle on a shelf at a later meeting and had the guy go towards the shelf and just look at the needle. And this was a needle with the cap on it and everything. And then that was that meeting. And this guy could leave at any point and say, Hey, this is too much. Then he had a needle on the table in between them and it was under a tissue. So the guy knew that the needle was there and, and you know, it just wasn't going to jump up and bite him. And you know, the eventual thing I'm, I'm kind of going slow in the story, but eventually that was the thing is this guy was able to kind of overcome his fear of needles, <clears throat> but it wasn't just because Jordan Peterson was being empathetic. He was challenging the guy. He was pushing them in a certain direction, right? And so uh, the, the author somewhat inaccurately brands Peterson as kind of the ultimate empathizer, but he is spot on in branding him as the guy who is demanding that men strive for greatness instead of niceness, right? Because that's the one thing that you get with, with a lot of people is when you're being empathetic, you sometimes leave things on the table. And that's one of the great things that I think most men are attracted to with Jordan Peterson. So those are the five quotes I wanted to bring out. But real quickly, I, I wanted to kind of go through as I was thinking through this article and thinking through the things that I know about Jordan Peterson that I'm a fan of is why is Jordan Peterson so popular amongst young men, including Christian men, right? That's a story that I've thought of or, uh, or a, a thought provoking idea that I've kind of been thinking a lot about. And I came up with three things that I think is why so many people are attracted to him, especially young men and Christian men. And the first reason is that he doesn't allow room for excuses. 
He, he just doesn't. He's a guy that calls balls and strikes, okay? So if he sees something that is wrong or intellectually dishonest or intellectually inconsistent or psychologically false or something like that, he's going to call it out. And so for a lot of guys, uh, you know, think about the needle guy. What if the excuse was just, oh, I just can't be around needles? Like, that's not a good enough excuse, right? It's, it's affecting your life and it's affecting your family. Your fear of these needles is something that you need to get over, right? And so he doesn't allow room for excuses. And so I think instinctively men are attracted to that type of an idea, okay? So the second reason why I think he's so popular amongst these young men is he's incredibly complicated and thus incredibly interesting, Okay, so this is a guy that is so unbelievably precise in his language, but he still leaves some room for ambiguity at at times, which seems like a contradictory statement, but he really does. Uh, He was asked uh, during, I think it may have even been on that first Joe Rogan podcast, if he believed in God. And it was one of those things where most of us just think that's a binary answer, right? Yes or no. But his answer was so dense and deep. Like he was like, basically, what do you mean by that question? which seems like a crazy response to, do you believe in God? But he's so complicated and his thought processes are so high and and so much higher than most people, definitely me, that it's just a very, it makes him very, very interesting, okay? And the third reason why I think he's so popular is because he's definitely open to being proven incorrect. He's open to that. And he says that all the time. I mean, at least once or twice in every speech or interview that I've seen him give, he's open to being wrong. And so you, sometimes you get this from, you know, the Calvinist people or the super theology people or, you know, people that have, you know, two or three degrees, they just can't be wrong. Like they, they will go way down the, the rabbit hole of intellectual dishonesty and they just will never admit that they're wrong. He's a guy that's definitely open to that. And so again, he doesn't allow room for excuses. He's incredibly complicated, thus incredibly interesting. And he's definitely open to being proven incorrect. So this is just a guy that I really think if you're not paying attention to him, it's someone that you should be paying attention to. This guy, I'm not elevating him uh, above some of the men in the church. I'm not elevating him in terms of importance. I'm not saying that he's never done anything wrong in his life. You know, again, when you live as much of a public life as he has, you know, for the last year or two, eventually some things are going to come come out about him that we're not all super proud of. But this isn't some sort of alt-right hero that, you know, is kind of doing these crazy things under the table. Like, he seems like a pretty straightforward guy, and he's definitely over open to revealing things about himself. So I would suggest that everybody begin to start paying attention to Jordan Peterson and really getting in touch with the Jordan Peterson effect that is going on in our culture right now. So um, before we leave out, we're going to do a quick resilience boost. So as every one of you up to this point probably know, we are a men's ministry and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. And specifically, we do that by providing content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. So today I'm going to focus on mental and spiritual resilience And I'm going to throw out a bunch of suggestions of things that you should read and watch and listen to uh, from Jordan Peterson. This will give you a very good primer as to who this guy is, what his philosophy is, and it might lead you in a few different directions because I'm assuming that a lot of things that he says and a lot of his uh, theological uh, things that he goes into and the underpinnings and psychology are going to be kind of coming through in this podcast, especially over the next several months. Okay. So a few things I'm going to throw out to you. So the first thing is to read this article that I read today. I would just go back and read it on your own, read it in your own way. And that is the voice evangelical men wish they had. And on all these, I'm providing the links to all these things in the description of this episode. So you don't necessarily have to pull over and write all this stuff down. So first read the article that I read today. And the second is to read his new book. So his new book came out just, you know, a Two, two or three weeks ago. Uh, it's called 12 Rules for Life, an Antidote to Chaos. Um, it was none, number one on Amazon for a while. I don't know if they're actually going to let it uh, end up on the New York Times list because they kind of keep that list uh, separate in a lot of different ways. But an incredibly popular book. I just started the book, so I think I'm two chapters in or something like that. So I'm going to be reading it. And as soon as I get done, I will very likely do an episode over that book. So I would definitely pick that up and read it. The third thing is to watch his uh, interview with Channel 4 News. That was the one I made mention of at the beginning of this episode. But it was a 30-minute interview with somebody who was being incredibly antagonistic. And just watching him work his way through that interview was incredibly impressive. Okay. The next thing is to listen to his first appearance on the Joe Rogan Experience. All right. So that's Joe Rogan's podcast. I think he's been on there twice now, maybe three times. But I want you to listen to that first interview. And so that is episode 958. So I think you can find that on... uh, on iTunes and I'm going to provide the links to all that as well or you could watch it on YouTube I'll put the link in there for that as well and the last thing is I want you to listen to his first lecture 
in the biblical series. Okay. So his first lecture, again, I, I think he did 12 or 13 of those lectures last year. This one was an introduction to the idea of God. Okay. And again, I'll provide the, the link to the podcast that he put that up on, on his YouTube channel that he put that up on. But I really think if you watch and li- or listen to that first one, you'll be incredibly interested to listen to the others. And like I said, these are unbelievably dense things that he puts out there. But if we're going to be mentally resilient Christian men, I think this is something that we can do to definitely challenge us, definitely challenge ourselves in these areas. Okay. Guys, as always, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Please subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Google Play and refer your friends to listen and share that on social media. We will certainly find all the Undaunted Life hashtags and like all the posts. Guys, if we deserve a five-star review, please, please leave one for us. That is how this podcast is going to continue to grow as we build into the future. Our website is www.undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Undaunted Life and Facebook.com backslash Undaunted Life. You can check out our free devotionals on the YouVersion app just search undaunted life under plans and as always we would like to thank august burns red for allowing us to use their music library for our content the intro outro track on this podcast is their song king of sorrow which is off their latest record entitled phantom anthem and the links to all that are in the description i'm your host kyle thompson remember keep cultivating manly resilience keep forging spiritual mental and physical toughness keep seeking the lion of judah